Good afternoon, uh, everybody. Welcome today to Lorraine from Four Seasons. We're very excited to have her here today to talk about a number of things, but in particular about how to give feedback in the care sector. So thank you for coming, Lorraine. We're excited to have you. Would you mind just um, maybe by starting giving a couple of minutes summary about your career today and maybe why you actually got into social care in the first place? Yeah, sure. Um, thank you for having me on as well. But um, right, where did I start? It was quite a long time ago now. But I started by training as a nurse. That was the beginning of my career. Uh, if you don't ca count the little bit beforehand where I worked on the uh, tills at a local supermarket. But other than that, the beginning of my career was my nurse training, which uh, He's going back to 1984 now, so quite a while ago, yeah. <laughs> and um, when I qualified, I really worked, I did a little bit of infectious diseases, which is very apt for uh, the current time. Yep. Um, but then I decided I would go and do my midwifery. But before I did my midwifery, I did a little bit of elderly care. And I kind of loved it really. And um didn't want to do the same thing that everybody else was doing so whilst everybody loves surgery and the medical wards and ITU uh, I, I found myself attracted to care of the elderly and I think in part because um, it was sort of they weren't treated very well I didn't think um, in the NHS and then when I left the NHS I did a little bit of time working in a care home and I really loved that because it was the first time that I was able to really use the skills from my nurse training and felt that I was in control of the decision making. So stayed within care homes and uh, I've pretty much done all of the jobs now in a care home and worked up, I suppose, through all of the operational structure um, to what I'm doing now as the COO of the Four Seasons Group. Wow, that's a that's a journey. Um, I also spent a few weeks in a supermarket, but I didn't last very long. So I'm sure you I'm sure you did better than me. Um, I think everyone everyone does at the beginning of their career. Yeah, I think um, so. So obviously, Four Seasons Group is a is a big operator. Um, yeah. Um, what do you a big What do you What does I know it, it offers a range of things. So maybe just give a bit of an update, a bit of a summary on what what you do offer, what services you offer your your residents there. I mean, mostly uh, our care homes are a mix of um, care homes offering nursing care so um, and residential. And then a little bit of the sort of specialities thrown in. So we do a lot of dementia care, again, both with nursing and also residential. Um, we do quite a bit of intermediate care. And we have quite a lot of contracts to do intermediate care. But I would say the majority of our care homes are nursing or residential for general elderly care. Great. And you're the COO, so that's a pretty big job. Um, maybe easy to say, what do, you, what do you not look after at the Four Seasons Group? <laughs> so interestingly, um, when I came into, into this post, and I think for my previous post as a COO of Brighter Kind, I was really sure that I wanted operations to always be at the heart of everything that happened in the organization. So in taking this role, I was keen that the whole organization had to be operationally led. So we are operationally centric and all of the support functions are set up so that they are doing that very thing of supporting the operators. And when I say the operators, I really mean the care homes. There is nothing more important in our organisation than the care home team um, led by the home manager. So every other function is there to support, is there to support the care homes. And because of that, I probably dip in and out of all of those other support functions. So my primary role is to lead the operation. So look at what's happening in the care homes and then all the support operationally from that in regional support managers regional managers mm. managing directors uh, but i also link in with every other support function as well i generally meet with the key leaders of those functions every month um, and nobody really gets to do anything in the care homes unless the operators have signed that off right so for me i have a general a general rule that is that if you're going into a care home or you're having contact with a care home uh, you have to be a blessing 
If you can't be a blessing to a care home, you shouldn't go in. I, I give everybody permission to stay in their car, sit on the car park, but don't go in unless you're really confident that you can be a blessing when you're when you're in there because they're busy enough. Yeah. So um, having people go in and out and only make their days more complicated is unhelpful. Right, interesting. Thank you. How many people work at Four Seasons these days? Well, I, I haven't counted them all, but let's go with let's go with circa ten and a half thousand. Ten and a half thousand people. Yeah. So that's a lot. So uh, the, the the main purpose for today is to help smaller providers out there who maybe don't have access to. Um, central resources to get a few tips and fee bits of feedback on how they can, you know, improve their management and in particular around feedback. So it'd be interesting to hear how you've changed your approach to management, both yourself and as an organization during, during the pandemic. That would be really interesting. Okay. Um, well, we've had quite an unusual time because I came into post um, at the um, end of 2019 and um and we went through a, an organizational restructure and we that was quite complicated really and in part that was a whole new leadership team coming in doing a restructure and the view was that we would embed a new culture and therefore a new way of operating and we would empower people to operate differently we went through that restructure and we put all of the right people in place in the teams and then we went into a pandemic mm. <laughs> which was not really what was planned and what was really difficult um was thinking about how we communicated with people right i think you know previously there was a very particular style that operationally we worked with which was a lot of face to face i was very keen on having meetings so um, I would have meetings every month and we'd get people in a room and I've always found that to be the very best way to communicate you know I think you should do things directly and you should yep. allow people the opportunity to um, give their opinion and talk things through and really understand what people's challenges are and that is much better done in person but a pandemic kind of stops all of that because suddenly we were locked down and all of the people who were new in post suddenly could not work in the way that we wanted them to we couldn't meet in rooms and we couldn't uh, mm. do things the way we had so i think the last 12 months has been a huge challenge for just operating in the way that would come naturally and trying to find other ways of um having those discussions which I think has been varied in how right. successful it has been. So what's what's worked well then and, and maybe what's not worked quite so well? So I think that um, I did something that I've never really done before and that was that I did a written message at the beginning of so this time last year, really, at the beginning of the pandemic, I did a daily message which went out to every single person who had a computer so if you've got a log on you got my message every morning and in part that was just you know what we wanted to do was to be able to say we're here this is what we're doing you're you're in a home or you're working from home but you're not on your own and uh, all of these people are in the background and this is what we're all trying to do and to give people the feeling that collectively we were all in um, the same boat and had the same challenge mm. that was quite hard I've never really communicated in that way before it was you know sending out a message every day it would take every evening me trying to think of what am I going to say tomorrow morning and what's going to interest people and what information are they going to want so the practicalities of things were easy you know what was the policy what were the decisions on things but the right words to express how we were feeling um, as an organization was quite hard and I'd not done that before so that was my first really big challenge mm. interestingly everybody really liked it I still do the same thing now but I do it once a week so once or twice a week I send out the same message uh, so it's called Lorraine's message and um, and it still goes out to everybody and um, anybody in the business can send things in and so um, you get a little bit of everything in the Lorraine's message and uh, all the feedback that we've had is that people really liked that and they can 
there's a, a mailbox and they can send stuff in or they can ask questions and we make sure we try and answer them. So that was very good. Okay. And you probably wouldn't have done that if... I'd never have done that, no. Before the pandemic. And you're going to try and keep it up, are you? Well, even if I want to stop, I get a lot of feedback saying, please don't. So, yeah, I'm still doing that. And um, what, what have your biggest learnings been yourself personally during the pandemic around sort of managing your team and your people? Um, I think I think what I've really learned um, has been that I need I need contact with people, which I suppose is not uh, a big surprise. All of my career, I've been in a team and working with people all the while. So suddenly being distant from people, I found very hard. Mm. And I found it quite difficult to even keep myself motivated and understanding what people wanted from me. That was quite tricky as well. And um, because I didn't have that instant feedback from people that I've always had, you know, you can be in a room with people and you understand how they're feeling and what they want from you. And not having that, I found really hard. Um, so I, I suppose it reinforced what I already knew, which is that I need to be around other people to keep me motivated and I keep me operating well. Um, and I, I think that I've always been somebody who plans, you know, that I'm always looking at things six steps ahead uh, generally. And that was very difficult last year and I've had to learn to do things differently everything was changing so fast I had to really operate very reactively yeah yeah it must be hard as well because um you, you have to be conscious of making too many reactive changes when you haven't maybe yeah. got the full context do you think your um teams I guess maybe some of the people probably feel they have more connection with you now than they've had before if you were previously used to only speaking to a smaller number of people and now you're communicating more broadly maybe maybe that's a positive maybe that's well, a positive thing yeah possibly but you know interesting I never um I'd never had the opportunity um really to speak to people mm. um because we'd gone through the restructure and although we'd gone through the restructure we hadn't had a chance to meet anybody so I was new to them anyway right. um you know as we went into the pandemic previous to that they'd had a different COO so yep. um I suppose so far this is all they really know from me okay. but as soon as we're allowed I will absolutely meet with home managers I've always met with home managers um and I think that's really important a lot of the decisions that I make affect the home teams it would be I think it would be catastrophic for me to not meet those people face to face and hear directly from them what they need from us as an organization yeah definitely what um maybe not yourself but what mistakes have you seen people making in this year in in, ter in terms of communication and management um, um well i suppose i mean it has been very difficult i think maybe you you can't do too much. I, people want to be communicated with. And mm. so um, when you think, oh, you know, should we really send something out? out? Should we have a meeting? Should we speak to people on the phone? Um, I think, you know, I've learned that people want that contact and you need to do as much of it as you can feasibly do. You know, no, that's not constantly asking them to do things or giving them stuff. It is just about making contact. I think yeah. people want to know that you care, that you're willing to listen. Some of it is just that, just listening and understanding what people have been going through. Yeah, yeah, Maybe sure. in the big scheme of things, you get caught up making the big decisions. You know, we spent so much time chasing PPE. <laughs> yeah. um, who knew that that was going to be a thing? Uh, looking at supply chains and understanding how many masks to buy and if we needed hand sanitizer. Um, but actually the most important thing was just to say to people, we know it's really hard. Uh, and yeah. I think that's, you know, that's the, that's the learning really that you have to make contact and listen. Definitely. And, you know, you're obviously a, a very senior person there and, you know, some people talk about management and leadership and they, some blend it together. Some people separate it. Do you, do you view, do you view yourself as a leader or a manager or a maybe, maybe a bit of both? Um, yeah, it's a really interesting question. So uh, we do quite a lot of work around leadership. I think 
everybody should be an inspirational leader. Everybody in the care homes, I think they're doing that and they don't even know um, what it's called, if if that makes sense. Do you know what I mean? There, there are people there that are always going above and beyond, that they are showing other team members what to do, that just their little kindnesses are um, inspirational and demonstrate leadership all the time. So I... I think that um, for me, leadership is super important. And I think that comes into every single activity you do. So managing is processy. You know, it's just sometimes it is just about going through the things that people need you to do. Um, but leadership is the most important thing and, and it should influence every activity. Um, if you're doing it well, good leadership should be influencing every activity. Definitely. And you think everyone should has a chance of being a leader in, in their uh, own way? Absolutely. And, and as I said, it's one of our you know key principles that we want people to think about their own inspirational leadership. How can they be leaders to those people around them? Um, and I think, like I said, I think people are doing it, but I think they need to start thinking about am I doing it? How am I doing it? What is, what is my leadership like? How am I showing other people? What message am I giving out? Um, but I think that's whether you're a maintenance man, somebody in the laundry, a carer, mm. a nurse, everybody has that opportunity every day. Great. Um, so the meat of today, I want to talk about feedback. Obviously, you know, being a nurse by training feedback, I imagine is something you've grown up with throughout your career, but um, you know, how important do you think feedback is in, in the care sector? I think, it's, I think it's absolutely vital, but I suppose not just in this sector, in any sector, I think for people to be successful, um, I think that there should be feedback. It's really interesting that when I've spoken to teams that haven't functioned very well and um, they've said, but I, I don't even know whether I'm doing my job well. Nobody's talked to me about it. I haven't had any feedback. It, um, am I doing am I doing this good? Uh, am I could I do it better? Do I need development? What does my manager think about me? I think those are key things that people um, think about all the time. And and so having feedback is is really positive. It helps you understand. Um, what you're doing and how you're doing it and what the expectations are and how you can develop. How do you, how do you give feedback, Lorraine? Um, so I think I give feedback all the time. I think it's, you know, perhaps my style is um, quite direct. Uh, <laughs> um, and so therefore, I think that I don't think that I operate with a lot of different agendas. I think that honesty and transparency is the best policy. So, um, but I think you should always do it with kindness and respect um, and think about how it would feel if somebody was saying it to you and how would you feel about it? So, I, and I think clarity, you know, I think that you shouldn't be woolly about your <laughs> about right. your feedback. You know, it shouldn't be confusing so that somebody goes out the door and is thinking, "I'm, what was that all about? I, I don't even know what that person was trying to say to me." So I, I think it has to be thought through. Um, I don't think you always have to set it up so that it's formal. I think that. that what do you What do you mean by that? Sorry. You know that you don't have to always announce it like. Um, on Wednesday, you know, you're going to come in here and we're going to sit down for an hour and then we're going to do this. Right. I think if you can build a relationship with people um, and have that trust and openness and people understand that you're being respectful, I think that feedback can happen in a more fluid way. Um, and that can be easier as well to do. And you, would you advise changing it? Do you change your style of feedback depending if you're speaking to one of your senior leaders versus maybe one of your newer members of staff? Yes, for I think for that reason that you need to have relationship, you know, to, to just do it 
uh, in a less formal way, there has to be that relationship there. So I can afford to do that with people who've worked with me for a while yep. um, because they understand what my style's like. They understand my personality. I know more about them. And so it's easy then to just say, should we just have a coffee and let's have a chat and how are you feeling? And well, let me tell you that I've observed these things. Um, when you don't have that relationship, I think it has to be more structured. How do you, what about the receiving of feedback? How do you advise people to receive feedback? Because some people can yeah. react negatively, some people clam up. What do you, what's your advice to someone who's receiving feedback? So I think my advice would be um, to not always view feedback as being negative. It, it's interesting that we were just talking about appraisals and the purpose of appraisals. And I think people can be quite um, unnerved by appraisals because they view them as quite negative. And actually, from the perspective of I'm going to get feedback, and although some of it might be positive, there will also be some potentially negative stuff in there is how people feel and therefore they go into it feeling quite defensive about what somebody's going to say i think the best way to receive feedback is it's an opportunity it's a mm. great opportunity to hear what people think and what their perspective is it doesn't mean that it's the truth it means that it's that person's perception of what has happened you know i, I hear lots of people saying but that isn't true right um, and what that means is that the intention of how you felt when you were doing something or saying something was not how the other person received it. Right. I think that's really valuable to hear because it means that you have to stop and think about whatever it was that you thought that you were doing or saying was not how it was received. And therefore you might have to change how you were doing or saying something for next time so that people receive it in a different way, in the way that you wanted them to receive it. Yeah, that's good. That I, I, I hear that. Yeah, that makes sense. I hear people say feedback is a gift. I mean, you know, I guess not all gifts are great, are they? So um, <laughs> um, how do you, if someone's not getting feedback or, you know, one of your, probably one of your homes, if people feel they're not getting enough feedback, how do you advise, how do you advise them trying to canvas more feedback without making it overly formal and fake? Um, feedback from who are you thinking? Well, I'm, I'm just trying to think someone who's maybe starting out in their career that's trying to learn, but doesn't, it doesn't feel like they're getting enough feedback. You know, is it simply a, a case of sitting down with the manager or the clinical lead and saying, I want feedback? Or how can they try to, encourage people to provide feedback if they feel they're not getting it because I, I hear a lot of people say i've never had feedback yeah um and I, I guess it's probably incumbent on them to try and solicit some feedback in some way so interestingly most people want to talk about themselves <laughs> so i often find that a key thing is is to ask people how they feel if right. you ask them how they feel about you or something um directly related to you people are often think oh i need to think about this a bit more or i'm not sure what i want to say or how are they going to receive it but if you ask them how they feel about the thing whatever the thing is yeah. actually they tend to give you more information that will relate to what you want to know because what you're really doing is getting their experience uh, about about the care home or how they work or what they're on the receiving end of. Yeah, um, exactly. And that, that helps you lead into saying, okay, I understand that's how you feel. How do you feel about this? If I was to do this, how would you feel about that? So yep. I think it's a good way into ask people how they feel and what their experience is like. Almost, almost give them permission to be able to give the feedback. Well, that's a fair point. How do you uh, how do you take feedback, Lorraine? And who who gives who gives you good feedback? Um, so I get feedback, uh, and I would encourage feedback from all the people who do um, work with me. So, um, and I usually do say that that I think I'm quite um, a dominant person accidentally. I don't always intend to be, but I think um, I can be. And I'm aware of that. So I usually say to people, um, I actually want you to challenge me and I want you to tell me what your view is. And I really value that. So those people who do that, I, I feel really quite close to. And um, I feel like it, 
they're really valued members of the team um, because sometimes the job title can be quite intimidating in itself. So people think, oh, I shouldn't really tell her what I think. Um, I, I, that is bothersome, really. Mm. I, I wish that the job title didn't put people off, that I think I need feedback as much as everybody else. So so you're, you're welcoming feedback from anyone at, at the Four Seasons Group? Um... Absolutely, yeah, because it is... It is how you learn and it is an opportunity. And that doesn't mean that I'm not like everybody else. And sometimes you hear something and then you feel a bit prickled by it because it's that thing of it's not what I intended. Sure. You know, so when people say to you, I didn't like this or I feel unhappy about that. And, and then you think, but I didn't mean it like that. So you hmm. have a moment where you think, well, that's not very fair. But actually, I think that is I do think that that is a gift. Because yeah. you otherwise you just wouldn't know that that's how people heard what you said. Definitely. And that especially, is an opportunity to change. Especially hard in these times where you're not getting that body language or that other stuff, Correct. right? So it's even harder. Um, you said you're a dominant person accidentally. What what does that mean? Why, why, um, why, or, and why are you a dominant person accidentally? Um, because I, I think because I am quite direct and I think in quite a direct way. I'm... Um, and I tend to speak what I'm thinking. I mean, obviously I do do a little bit of filtering in between like everybody, <laughs> um, but, but yeah, I think I think quite quickly, I'm able to verbalize it quite quickly. And I think that can be quite challenging for people that I can give an opinion quite freely. Um, so I don't mean to be dominating, but my um, process for thinking is actually I do speak out that you know I do speak it out mm. so my process is quite I need to talk about it and I need to say it to people and get their response to things um and that it, I think that can be hard for particularly some people who need to go away and contemplate sure. stuff. <laughs> um, um so so for your newer managers or people looking to progress into management what's your What's your tip, your top tips, Lorraine's top tips on how to how they can give effective feedback when they're stepping into you know a leadership position for one of the first times? Um, I think that my first tip would be um, to think very carefully about what you're going to say. Like, don't say throw away remarks because what you say to somebody, they're going to go away and think about and it's no good after the event saying well, I, I didn't really mean that yeah. um so uh, my first tip would be to think about what it is you're saying how you're saying it and what you want that person to do with that information so you need to plan it even if it's informally you must already have um thought it through right uh, i think my second tip would be that be respectful I don't, don't think that because you hold a certain job role that somehow you're more important than anybody that you're speaking to. You're equals, you might, your jobs might be different, you might be carrying out different tasks, but actually you're working as a team and you all have a part to play. So I think if you go into any conversation thinking that you have more power or more control, I think that's really detrimental to the outcome of the discussion. Okay. So be respectful of what that person is bringing um, and understand their job. Okay. Um, so good. So planning and respect would be your two yes. top tips. And just be clear. Like I said earlier, don't try and talk around stuff. You mm. know, if you've got something to say, you should actually try and say it with clarity, not think oh, I'm not sure about which words to use because, you know, yeah know. sure um because it's confusing no i think that's a very good bit of advice actually i might take that myself and, and use that one myself um okay well that's really interesting thanks for that uh thanks for the information around feedback hopefully some people will gather some um good insights there just a couple of questions before we wrap up because i know you've got um a new puppy and probably probably time <laughs> to go to take them for a walk he knows what he's eating while we're <laughs> <laughs> um so 
obviously lots of change the last year in the care sector. Just wondering what your sort of thoughts are for the next few years. How any any big changes on the horizon? I don't mean necessarily at your company, but yeah. more broadly. It's really interesting, isn't it? And um, we talk about this quite a lot about what will the future hold. And I think it's unknown, actually. I think these are new times that I don't know how um, the sector will recover from the pandemic and what that will look like. What I would hope comes out of it, if nothing else, because I'm sure things will bounce back. um, What I really hope is that people don't forget the part that Mm. actually care homes particularly played and how important the teams were that carried on working and um, the level of care that they have given to the elderly community. And I think it's one of the first times that um, people have had some insight into that, where they've had to leave their loved ones in the care of our teams um, in all care homes and all providers and have had been forced to step away and have other people uh, look after them. I think it's raised the profile and I hope that doesn't change, that people understand how important it is caring for the elderly. Fantastic. Um, No, I agree with you. And maybe to wrap up then, so, you know, obviously I imagine four seasons, 10 and a half thousand people, you're probably always, you know, looking for good people. if people want to find out more about the group and what you're doing, where's the best place to get information or or find out what opportunities there are, really? Yeah, I mean, all the all the usual ways of um, searching for jobs, but certainly go on to the Four Seasons website and follow the links through there and it will show you uh, all of the opportunities that are available. Um, and get in touch with any any of the office numbers. Give us a call. We're happy to chat to you and find somebody who can help you if we know what your specific requirements are. Um, yeah, we, we would like to hear from you. And I think I would just say I'm really looking for people who are passionate about care. It, it doesn't matter all the other stuff. The thing that I really want is people who are passionate about care who get up and think it would be fantastic today if I could help somebody. Uh, Those are the people that I really want in the team. You can train everything else, uh, but the energy and passion that's required, I think has to exist within. So I'm really keen to have those people apply. Fantastic. Lorraine, thank you so much. That was really interesting. Um, You know, I've definitely learned a few things myself and um, good luck with your puppy. and, (laughs) And I hope to see you again soon. Thank you very much.